Again, I'm Pam Stevens, and I, I work with the EP team, a, a great team over here to do emergency planning at Jeffco. And I want to just say welcome to our first training for 2013. We um, have some exciting trainings coming up that I just wanted to give you a heads up on what's coming. Next month, we're going to have the opportunity to go to St. Anthony's Hospital and meet our EP partners there and do a tour of part of their facility. So that should be exciting and informative. Give us a little bit of an idea of what emergency planning looks like from a hospital perspective. And then in March, we're going to have the opportunity to participate in a regional training that is going to simulate an anthrax event. So that should be a great training for us to be part of, and hopefully everybody will be able to attend, we'll be able to learn a lot about what that type of activation looks like on a, a regional level. We had the opportunity last year to do some great trainings on this team. We were able to meet with our coroner and have some training on mass fatalities. We were able to get some information on communications and using our radios. We had some information on activating our pods and our um, local transfer point. But there's actually an area of emergency preparedness that comes before all of that. And that is our own individual and family preparedness. That is an important piece of us being able to not only make sure our families are safe and taken care of in an emergency, but to be able to respond on this team as well. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about that piece of emergency preparedness. My experience with emergency planning actually began about 10 years ago when I was working as a case manager in a residential facility for teen moms. Part of their grant funding was that they sent a member of their team to attend an emergency preparedness training. And so they asked me to go to a, a CERT training, a certified um, a citizen's emergency response team training, which ended up being a two-day training. It was very comprehensive, a lot of information. And I actually walked away from that training feeling fairly overwhelmed. I received information on sheltering in place, on evacuation, on communications, on building a kit, but I really wasn't sure how to take all of that information, considering all of the different hazards and, and risks that I might need to respond to, and narrow that all down, and I, I just felt overwhelmed. So I took that information and I broke it down into pieces. And I decided that I was gonna take one piece of that preparedness and I was gonna work on it a month. And it felt much more manageable that way. When I had broken it down like that, it felt like something that I could do. So once a month, I put it on my calendar, put that, whatever that area of preparedness was that I wanted to do for myself and my family, and I completed that. And at the end of that year, I actually had a shelter in place kit that I felt confident my family would be able to manage for three or five days, three to five days in our home. I had talked with my family about where we might evacuate to, if we did evacuate, if we ended up in different places, where might we go and how would we be able to reconnect with each other? So we had talked about that. We talked about a communication plan. How would we stay in touch with one another if we ended up being scattered to different places like what happened in Hurricane Katrina? And I had a kit in my car that I felt confident if I needed to evacuate quickly, I would have those basic emergency supplies that my family might need to be able to do that effectively. So my hope is to be able to take that process and break it down for you and begin today by giving you just kind of an overview of what this might look like. And then over the next year, through sending emails, supporting, offering information, answering questions, maybe we can help all of you do that same process and just take something that can sometimes feel a bit overwhelming and break it down and make it very manageable for you. So I want to start by considering a scenario. How many of you, if our community was hit by a severe snowstorm, would be able to stay in your home for three to five days without any outside assistance whatsoever? Raise your hand if you think you could do it. Awesome, that's great. Okay, let's take it one level further. How many of you could stay in your home for three or four days if it was the middle of January, temperatures were dropping down into the teens and single digits, and the power went off in your home. You had no electricity, no heat, and you needed to be able to stay there for three to five days. How many of you could manage that now? That's great. So one more level. Let's say you had a family member that was dependent on oxygen and needed that to be able to breathe. They had a concentrator that was dependent on electricity. How many, are you gonna be, how many would be able to manage that for several days now? It's a tough one, it's a tough one. I actually faced a situation in my personal life several years ago that really brought this whole scenario home for me. I have a child who has a medical condition called cold urticaria. What that means is if she's exposed to cold temperatures for an extended period of time, it can actually be life-threatening. It can result in an anaphylactic reaction. 
and the power went off in our home. Well, we weren't really overly concerned about that. It happened, you know, on a regular basis. Every twice a year, usually, the power would go off, and it'd come back on within a couple of hours. Well, this particular time, it was a blizzard outside, temperatures were dropping quickly, and it'd been four hours, and the power was still off. We had bundled her blankets on her and piled her into an area where she'd be hopefully in a warmer part of the home. But I called the utility company at this point thinking, wow, the power is almost always on by now. And I asked them, can you tell me when the power is going to be back on? And they said, no, we can't tell you. It's a, it's a widespread event. We don't know when the power is going to be on. So I explained to them, well, I have a child that this could really be a risk and explained the situation. And they said, well, if you're really concerned about that, then we recommend you move her to a, a warmer location. So while we were contemplating taking her out into the cold, onto those slippery roads, and taking the risk of trying to get to a motel or a friend's house under those conditions, maybe sliding off the side of the road, which would put her in, in even a more precarious situation, thankfully the power came back on. But it was an important lesson. We had firewood, we had used it, we had burned it, which had been our backup plan to be able to keep her warm. And we're sitting there thinking, wow, we, we did not plan very well. We didn't think about this. So I, I committed after that that I, I really understood firsthand why this process is important. I realized that it can happen so quickly. And if we aren't prepared, we can get into a lot of trouble very fast. So where do we begin? Well, 10 years ago, one of the things that was taught to me in that CERT training was we not only need to know what to do, but we need to know what we are planning for. What are the hazards and risks that are most likely in our area that could put us at risk? If you take a look in the emergency uh, preparedness guide that you have on the table, if you go to page 23, it lists a lot of the um, risks and hazards, both man-made and natural, that are most likely in Jefferson County. That can be a good place to start. That will give you an idea of what we are most at risk at in this area. So you can start there. And then also know how to respond. In that same book, starting on page, um, on page five, is a list of lots of the items that you would need to be able to start putting together a plan. It has information on what to put in a grab and go kit, what information you might need to know about evacuation, first aid, planning for your, your pets, special needs. So begin with that book. That will give you some great ideas on how to start that process. Think about how you'll communicate with your family if you do get separated. Think about what communication plan you might use. Think about what you might need to do if you have any family members with special needs. If you have family members that are dependent on a wheelchair or have special um, dietary needs or if you have a pet, think about that. And then also try to look at it from two different perspectives. What would you do if you needed to shelter in place in your home? And then what would you do in that same situation if you needed to evacuate? So I'm going to go through each one of those in a little bit more detail. In looking at the hazards, think about do you live in an area that might be at higher risk for wildfires? And not only thinking about where you live, but also consider where you work. Because we spend a lot of our time in our place of employment, and many of us may have a, um, a shelter-in-place kit in our home, but we haven't thought about we could get stranded here for three, three to five days. So think about building that kit for your, your place of employment or any place that you spend a reasonable amount of time. Excuse me. Think about whether your home is in a place that could be at risk for flooding, rising water. Are you in a floodplain? Do you live in a rural area that might be at higher risk for tornadoes? Um, in Colorado, we all need to be aware of severe weather, uh, lots of snow. We have extreme heat, extreme cold temperatures here. And unfortunately, all of us need to consider events that might be related to terrorist activity or events that could be accidents that have hazardous materials or, or chemicals involved. So begin by thinking about those hazards and think for, build your plan from that perspective. What are the hazards I need to plan for and where do I begin? So start by also considering the resources that you use on a daily basis. What do you use every single day that you might need to have if you needed to shelter in place in your home or if you needed to evacuate? And make a list of those. Start for a week and just think of everything you <coughs> used in that week that you might need to have on hand. Um, things that we often don't think of are disinfectants, laundry soap, um, hand soap, the things that we only use you know, every so often, once a week or twice a week for laundry. Those are the kinds of things that you kind of build that list over the course of a week and it will help you to, to notice some of those things we don't use as often. And then think about 
what you would need to do to have those, those items for three to five days. What would it take to stockpile? If you were in your home and you didn't have access to be able to get out and get more, what would you need to do? Then think about those critical resources, the things you would absolutely need to have to be able to stay in your home. If you are dependent on some type of a, a daily medication that could impact you if you missed it for a couple of days, that's a critical resource. That's something we need to have not only on hand, but a backup plan. So if we are, we just took that last tablet yesterday and we're sheltering in place in our home for three, five, three to five days today, how are we gonna manage that? So that's the kind of thing to think about. How would you provide heat for your home if you were in your home for three days and, and the heat was off, the power was off? How would you do the electricity thing if you had a family member that needed access to that? Um, and then also think about any type of basics for survival that you might need to have, the things like food, um, water, first aid supplies, those things that we all, would all need access to. Also think about um, access to light. I know if I was in my home for three or four days and my power went off, I wouldn't want to sit in the dark for a couple of days. So flashlights can be handy, but a lantern will light a room. So keep that in mind as well. And consider any personal care items. If not so much in our homes, if we sheltered in place, most of us have a toothbrush and toothpaste, but if you needed to evacuate, if you needed to leave your home, what types of things would you want to have if you ended up, we had a, a colleague that had a house fire and ended up having to leave her home quickly. What types of items would you want if you had that much time? Because we think about evacuation, we think, oh, well, we'll have 30 minutes or a six hour notice even. And so we consider we would have time to pack up. But what if you're going out of your house at two o'clock in the morning in your pajamas and what you have is what is on your body and you had to go to a motel for that night? What items would you want to have? Would you want to stop at Walmart to pick up a toothbrush and a change of clothes and some slippers because you're barefoot? Most of us wouldn't want to have to make a trip to Walmart like that. So think about the things that you could keep in your car, in the trunk of your car, in a, in a plastic container for that kind of a scenario. What are those critical supplies that you would want to have? You'd want a toothbrush. You'd maybe want um, some change of clothes, some of those things that if you had to just evacuate quickly. So keep that in mind as well. Also consider entertainment or comfort items. If the power went off in my house for three days and I didn't have access to electricity, I'm not much of a TV watcher, but I'm on my computer all the time. Um, I would have trouble entertaining myself for three days with no electricity. So think about that. Have things on hand, especially if you have children. And especially if you think there's any possibility, which there is a possibility for all of us, that we could spend a few days in a Red Cross shelter. If you have children, how would you entertain them for three days in a sheltering environment? Or even if it was just me, if I wasn't planning for children, I'd at least want a book or um, maybe a deck of cards, something. I wouldn't want to sit in a shelter for three days with nothing to do. That would drive me crazy. So keep that in mind as well. Also consider any documentation, any important papers you might need to have. If you need to leave your house very quickly and in the unfortunate event, maybe we weren't able to come back to our home, our home was destroyed, what papers would we want to have with us? Consider keeping those in hard copy format that in a grab and go kit that you can take with you as you bolt out the door. Um, I don't keep those in my car in hard copy just because of the risk of my car getting broken into and maybe somebody having access to those. But there are locking flash drives that you can actually scan that information, put it onto a flash drive and that locks and you can toss that in your grab and go kit. And then those items are secure and you have them with you if you do need to evacuate. Keep a copy of your ID in that. You never know if you end up evacuating quickly, your, your purse or your wallet might be on your nightstand. So do keep a copy of your ID. Think of any specific family, um, family specific items you might need. Do you have an infant that you're planning for? Do you have a family member with special food needs? I have a, a child who, um, fortunately, as she's getting older, she's outgrowing many of them, but she had many, many food allergies when she was young. Managing in a, in a community shelter would have been almost impossible with her. She was allergic to wheat and eggs and dairy and soy. Trying to feed her in that kind of an environment would have been very difficult. So I would have had to have kept that in mind and think about what type of food I would need for her. Um, Think about anything you might need if you have pets to evacuate. This is an important one because if you do end up in a Red Cross shelter, they aren't able to take pets unless they're assistance animals, but they do try to co-locate. But one thing that a lot of people don't know is if we don't have copy of our pet's vaccination records, it can be a problem. It's a more difficult situation to be able to keep your pets in that environment with you if you don't have copies of their vaccination records. And also, if you don't have a crate for your pet, consider possibly um, purchasing one of those because there are motels that 
normally would not take pets, but if you have a crate and you can show proof of vaccination for your pets, will sometimes allow you in an emergency situation to bring your pets into that motel room with you. If you say, I'll keep them in the crate when they're in the motel room, only take them out when we need to go out. Um, and that way, if you end up in a problem trying to find a motel with pets, sometimes if you have a crate, you have a copy of their vaccination records, you have a leash, you have your own supplies, you might be in a better situation to be able to keep your pet with you. Also, any types of tools, um, those basic first aid, basic um, emergency supplies that we should all have stockpiled, a, a fire extinguisher, a, a battery operated radio, be sure to keep extra batteries for your flashlight and your radio. Jumper cables, tools, shovel. Um, one thing that I have several of, and I went to the expense to do this for um, a reason that I learned a couple of years ago, my phone broke. And although, a charger wouldn't have probably helped me in that situation. In almost any other situation that I'm leaving and separating from my home, that charger would have helped me. Most of us will have access to a phone in a disaster. There are usually people around us that have a cell phone if we don't. In an emergency shelter, they'll most likely have phones that you can use. What I realized, though, was even if I had a phone, it wouldn't have done me any good because I did not have a single phone number memorized. They were all in my phone. So, Try to keep a copy of your charger, just an extra one at your office, maybe in your car, but also keep a hard copy of those critical phone numbers and something you'd likely take with you if you did need to leave your home quickly, in your purse, in your wallet, keep a copy in your car. Phone numbers aren't a secure item. If somebody finds them, that it's not an issue. That way you'd have those critical phone numbers. I can't imagine if I was separated from my family, didn't know where they were, didn't know if they were okay, and didn't even have the capacity to, to get a hold of them and, and call them because I had left their phone numbers behind. So remember that. And then also um, consider popping some earplugs into your grab and go kit. If you do end up in a community shelter, it might help you get a little bit better night's sleep. And then consider building two different kits. One that you would use to shelter in place in your home, one that you throw on a closet shelf, throw in a, in a cabinet, and one that you use to evacuate. One that you can put in a plastic container, grab and go with it, better yet, keep it in your car. Keep it in the trunk of your car so it's there. If you have to leave your home at, at two o'clock in the morning because your house is on fire, you're not grabbing stuff. You're not trying to grab a kit on your way out the door. It's in your car and, and you're good to go. <coughs> Include your support network in your planning. Talk with your family, talk with your children, with your parents, any of those people who might be involved in responding to an emergency with you. Plan with them, get their input so that, that you have their buy-in. I've been trying to do this with my children that don't see quite the necessity of emergency preparedness that I do, but I am trying to include them in the process and get their buy-in because I know that they're gonna be a lot more likely to implement some of this if they see the reason behind that. So include your network. Talk about how um, you will evacuate, where you will go. Keep that communication plan going with them. Talk to them and, and try to make sure you've got a good plan in place. And then include an out of area contact or a backup plan for your communication process. During large scale emergencies, a lot of times cell systems get overwhelmed. So we aren't able to use our cell phones. So think of a backup plan. Is your family networked on Facebook? Could you maybe have that be your backup plan? We'll get a hold of each other on Facebook. We'll send messages that way. Or have a contact that's out of the area. Sometimes when we can't use our cell phones, we can use a landline or we can use a long distance line and get in touch with somebody who's way out of the area, who's in another state, when we weren't able to make communication with people who are local. So I have a, a sister who lives in California and that's our long distance um, contact and she would be our liaison. We would all call her and she would network for us where we are, who's safe, who needs what. So try to also have that contact. I wanted to talk just a little bit more about evacuation because there's some important points that um, I wanted to make sure that we all consider. I learned about that first bullet point um, in an experience in my own life with the same child that has the health condition. She also has asthma. And she had had a respiratory virus and had been doing okay during the day. But as the, the night wore on, she started to get sicker. And about midnight, we realized we were gonna have to go to the emergency room. So we piled her in the car, drove off to the emergency room, got about halfway there, and I looked down and my gas gauge was completely on empty. I was just about out of gas. I thankfully made it to the emergency room. We even actually made it to the gas station in the morning, which I was totally amazed. I had set up a plan of somebody to come get me because I didn't think we were gonna make it. But I committed after that, I now consider half a tank empty in my car. I wanna make sure if I do have to evacuate, I'm not gonna be sitting in a long evacuation line at a gas station to try and put some gas in my car. Um, I also wanted to comment on 
If you do need to evacuate, to take one vehicle with you, which can be a benefit. If you do that half tank full thing, not only would you have a half a tank in the vehicle you're taking, but you could potentially siphon another half a tank out of another car into that tank, and you'd be able to evacuate with a full tank of gas. But the importance of taking only one vehicle isn't so much the gas factor, Quite often, we have a tendency to want to take as much as we possibly can when we have to evacuate. We want to take both of our cars. We want to pile as much into it as we can, and then you know we'll drive one, and our spouse will drive the other, and because we want to make sure we get our belongings out if we're not able to go back in. And our cars are one of our valuable possessions. We want to make sure our cars are safe if something happens in our community and we can't get back there to get our car. But during evacuations, the more cars on the road, the more gridlock and the less likely it is that everybody's gonna be able to evacuate safely. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about, gee, I wanna take two cars or even three cars. Think about that, that for us it's our property, but for others, it may be their lives, being able to get out of that environment and be safe. So please just take one vehicle when you do evacuate. Be sure you keep some of those critical supplies in your car. If you have time, go ahead and secure your home, lock your doors, lock your windows, unplug any of your appliances. If you are advised to do so from your utility company or your first responders, go ahead and turn off the main switches to your electrical and, and gas mains. And then please follow the instructions of, of the police or first responders on evacuation routes. When people have been sitting in evacuation lines on highways, there's also a tendency to say, wow, you know, I bet if I take this exit, I could zip off here and I could find a, a way to get by all this traffic and, and get out of here more quickly. But there's times that those first responders know of risks and hazards in the area that you may not know of. And they have you on that road in that particular evacuation route to protect you and to get you out as quickly and safely as possible. So do follow those evacuation routes. And then also, please leave early enough to avoid getting into a difficult situation. Um, unfortunately, a large number of, of people who may have survived otherwise have lost their lives in emergencies because not only did they not leave quickly enough, but they stayed and they didn't um, follow evacuation, evacuation um, expectations and they stayed in their home and ended up losing their lives. So do, do go ahead and evacuate and evacuate as quickly as you can. During a disaster is not when we want to be thinking about these issues, it's too late. We can do some uh, just emergency response. Most of us are, are good at that, we do that, but we don't want that to be the way we respond. I really liked this quote and I included it because I, I thought it really spoke to this message and it says, the likelihood that you and your family will recover from an emergency tomorrow often depends on the planning and preparation you do today. Being able to have your family be safe, being able to make sure that you have the resources in place that you may need, or even the resources you may need to evacuate quickly and get out and, and be safe, is gonna depend on some of the things that you do, do up front. So learn about the risks and hazards in your community. Take the time to create an emergency response plan, stockpile those resources, and keep in mind that at that minimum of three to five days. Also include those emergency contact numbers and those emergency papers and plan how your family will stay in contact. And then also consider taking a CPR class, a first aid class. It may make a difference if you're in your home for five days and you've got someone who's sick or injured, you might be able to take better care of them if you've got a basic first aid class. If you need any more information, there is great information on the JCPH website under emergency preparedness. We've got links to many good resources. You can also try the, the ready.gov website. They've got great resources, as does Red Cross. Please feel free to call any member of our team. We'd be happy to answer any questions, help you with some preparedness work that you're doing. Um, I'll also be sending out a monthly email to just kind of jog your memory, give you a reminder of some things that maybe you could be doing that month, and try to, to go through the year. And hopefully by the end of the year, with those email reminders and some of the work you guys will be doing, you'll be able to say at the end of this year that you feel confident that your families are ready to respond to anything that could come their way. So, any questions? All right. Well, I have a couple of activities that I am very much a hands-on learner. I, I learn by visually watching a PowerPoint, by listening, but for me, if I don't take that information and put it into practice, it just really doesn't embed for me. So I always try to plan a couple of activities whenever I present, and I actually have some fun prizes for these too. So hopefully it'll be exciting. <laughs> The first one I wanted to look at, and I'd actually like you, thank you, I'd actually like you to um, write your name 
on the top of this because I want to collect them because I'm, I'm hoping to do another training similar to this at the end of the year and I want us all to be able to pull these out at that time and see how much more prepared we are than we were in January. So it can just be that, that great reward or that feeling of success of accomplishment when we're done. So I want you to just go through and check off any of the items that you currently have in your home. So the items that you currently have in your home or vehicle that you could use to respond to an event if you were required to shelter in place in your home for five days. So please only check those items that you have a stockpile that will last you five days in your home. If you know you're just about out of laundry soap, don't, don't check that one. So go ahead and check anything that you have in your home you could use. And then on the last page I wrote, if there's any items that you can think of that you could use for an emergency or disaster that you have in your home, go ahead and turn it over and write on the back. If you can think of things that aren't on this list, so if we have a, a tie between people who have the same number of things, we can do a tiebreaker that way. Okay, thank you.